Hey, it's Jordan. Delighted to be joined by Jennifer Sass. You're a senior scientist with the uh, National Resource Defense Council, and uh, you are an expert on uh, tox toxins, uh, health and food, and uh, the People's and Communities Program. Um, so obviously, the attention is on the residents of East Palestine. Also, uh, I would say should be on you know, 10 to 20 mile radius. Uh, I, I've spoken with residents who are experiencing yeah. symptoms, uh, not just in East Palestine, but uh, West and East. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to kind of drill down on the toxins that uh, are in the air and, uh, you know, possibly the water, soil. Um, so vinyl chloride obviously uh, sounds like the, the most dangerous uh, of the chemicals on that train. And uh, it's my understanding that when vinyl chloride explodes uh it turns into phosgene which was used in world war ii do i have that right yeah it, that's right when it's uh it, un, under combustion it, it produces phosgene other things too like dioxins and furans and other really toxic stuff i mean you're really i mean it's it, these they're all petrochemicals which means they're fossil fuel derived so there's there's no part of their cycle where they're safe whether it's you know, extraction, production, manufacturing, disposal, these kinds of accidental spills and releases and incidents. Um, yeah, they um, hazardous materials beget hazardous materials. Right. And can you kind of explain, not that you're uh, testing for the EPA or anything, but I'm hearing from a lot of residents, their home smells like gas, one said mm -hmm. formaldehyde, uh, you know, some really toxic stuff. Yet yeah. the testing is according to them, showing up no vinyl chloride or, you know, any any quantities outside whatever they consider the normal range, then what is it folks are smelling and can that be dangerous right. even if it's not coming up uh, in what the EPA considers troubling ranges? Yeah, thanks. I would answer that a couple ways. First of all, um, if you can smell it, it's already at levels that are concerning. So uh, the, the our, our detection levels for smelling it are already exceeding, you know, OSHA lifetime ex worker lifetime exposure levels. Um, so already that's a concern. Um, there are exposure levels below what we can smell it at that I would still be concerned about. So that's one thing to know. Um, the second way I'd answer that is, while there is uh, a sense of, you know, higher doses are worse for you, for sure there's a dose response relationship, um, even at low doses and even short term or, or short duration doses are still harmful. And that's because these chemicals are inherently hazardous. Like vinyl chloride causes cancer. That's an inherent property of the chemical and it's not gonna change. So uh, less exposure to a carcinogen is, is less, you know, poses less of a risk than more exposure, but it, there, all of it is a risk. It, it, there's never a no risk phase when you're talking about exposure to hazardous chemicals, in particular, because one has to consider vulnerable populations like pregnant women, like children, like elders, like people with um, other diseases or medical concerns. And also when you consider the cumulative exposures along with other uh, chemical exposures and stresses that people are experiencing, those, those uh, compound. Um, so, we're not really talking in real life about a little bit of, you know, a, a little bit of exposure to a hazardous chemical all by itself to a healthy, you know, adult. Um, we're considering a diverse population with people with all different sort of health and exposure backgrounds um, and uh, and these chemicals in conjunction with other chemicals that were also spilled on the train as well as in their environment. And can we talk about the weather aspect of this? Because yeah. if it rains or wind mm -hmm. or anything, can't particles be moving and can't that go into the groundwater? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this is always something to consider. It's one of my first considerations when people say, you know, how far will it go? Where will it go? When will it reach the water table? I say, you know, it, that depends on the wind. It depends on weather. It depends on whether you're up or downstream. If you're talking about water, you know, higher or lower, it's what directions could go. Um, it could take days or weeks or months 
to reach groundwater tables or to reach surface water, but it, it will. These chemicals don't go away, right? They're, um, so these petrochemicals will get into those uh, soil and water tables. And so there should be monitoring far out. This, I mean, I just want to add, because I know you're, you know, you have time to go into some deeper analysis, that this is actually one of the things that polluters will do to hide the risks of their chemicals, is they'll do things like they'll conduct an exposure or a health assessment saying, you know, we drew a circle around the area some like half a mile or one mile, but maybe all the wind direction was in, you know, prevalent winds were in one direction. So there's, they're diluting out the health harms by looking in at what seems like a, a fair or even circle around the area, when in fact it could be many more miles of exposure in the direction of prevailing winds or in the direction that the water runs. And also, I mean, the company, Aaron Brockovich said this to me, that it could take weeks yeah. for some of this stuff to show up. So yeah, she's right. The EPA testing now saying we're not detecting, you know, alarming levels in the air oh, cool. or uh, water. Does that necessarily mean all clear or could this show up later? No. And I mean, I hope even the EPA doesn't know that's an all clear, but um, I mean, it, it's well, that's, how the, that's how the media is reporting it. That is. Yeah. I mean. It's helpful to know, I mean, there should be transparency and just public disclosure about the monitoring results. So the monitoring results should be frequent um, and they should be disclosed, uh, accurately disclosed uh, to the public. But it needs to be ongoing. There needs to be ongoing water monitoring. People with well water, um, especially if they're they're on the downstream side or in water tables where it's likely to go, need to be continuously, you know, having ongoing monitoring, not continuous monitoring maybe, but spot monitoring. Um, and health effects need to be monitored. There needs to be some long-term um, health effects monitoring going out for the community, for workers that were exposed, for cleanup workers, for first responders, um, and for anybody else in the area that may have been exposed, because some of the effects may alleviate, some may not. Uh, it's important information um, to have to really understand the impact of this disaster. And obviously, I mean, it's not your first rodeo uh, being with the NRDC. So obviously, Norfolk Southern, uh, the big battle is going to be to try and narrow the victim radius to as narrow an area as they could get it. Uh, it, it, I'm sure if it were up to them, they'd say it's only a mile. I'm talking to uh, people as far as 15 miles, 20 miles that are experiencing symptoms. Um, I just want to play this one clip for you. Uh, this is from a resident in Poland, Ohio, uh, which is 15 miles away. Uh, and let's hear what she was experiencing. So talk to me about um, when did you when did you first start noticing anything in terms of your own health, uh, you know, anyone in your family. The controlled release began on February 6th, which was Monday. Um, it was towards the end of the day, probably, I think it was like between four and five o'clock is when they initially started doing it. I was outside having my coffee, like I do every night after dinner. And I didn't notice a smell in the air and I didn't even expect to smell anything being 15 miles away but I did notice that my coffee tasted unusually bitter. Um, a little bit later, it was back out on my porch and I, again, coffee still tasting bitter. And then I noticed my lips started feeling numb. Uh, the roof of my mouth started feeling numb. My tongue started burning and my throat started burning. Wow. At that point, I went in the house and I got my husband and I said, come out here and smell the air. I said, because I think it smells funny. I could smell some a burning smell. He took a big breath in. He said, yeah, I smell something out there. He said it smelled like burning electronics. And then this proceeded two, maybe three more times throughout the night. I would go out, experience the symptoms, come back in, and they would dissipate. And... I, again, I didn't think anything of it. I'm like, cause it wasn't sticking once I went back in the house, like the symptoms would just dissipate. And at that point I had like, my tongue just was fried. 
by the time I woke up the next morning, it felt like I had been scalded because I, as I talked to you in our communication prior to right now, I did experience the gastrointestinal bleeding, which I believe was because of the coffee that was like oddly bitter. I think whatever was in the air got into the coffee. So that was a resident. Uh, she went to her doctor who told her, or, you know, obviously looked at her and said she had chemical exposure in her ear, mm -hmm. nose and throat. Uh, obviously, I'm not asking you to diagnose or anything like that, but if that's 15 miles away, I've heard uh, people smelling it and feeling some stuff in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, how do you even begin with that? How do you even begin to know how far this is and right. whether these are short term acute things that will improve or potentially long term issues? Yeah, I mean, there people should have been told to close their windows, stay indoors, n n turn off their heat if it was bringing in outside air. I mean, there's things that people could have done to be aware and protect themselves. It's, and again, especially if you have vulnerable um, asthmatics, people with ex you know COPD, people with existing um, lung ailments potentially would be more vulnerable. They would be your canary in a coal mine, more sensitive. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's just a real failure to not have to, to not having warned, alerted, and prepared populations. And, and that's not even getting to, should, is, was that the right you know, way strategy to deal with those chemicals? Because that's really being challenged as well. But I'm just, I'm just talking about like public right to know. Um, the other thing is this, this woman did the right thing. She, she went inside, she alerted her family members and, and they felt the same thing. She went inside, she's tried to protect herself as best she could. And she reported it to her physician. That's the right thing to do. The, in this case, she reports that her physician it actually diagnosed it as a chemical exposure. Not all doctors are going to know that, especially if they're 15 miles away, they may not even think about it. That's an issue. And so then people aren't getting accurate information from the from their medical physicians. If physicians don't know what's happening, they can't appropriately diagnose and treat their patients. Um, and that data isn't being collected to inform the larger um, picture about impacts from this chemical and the burning of these chemicals. So, which creates other toxic chemicals. I mean, just there was like, it was like a, you know, a compounding nightmare. Um, so there needs to be that kind of coordination, that kind of shared information and coordination. And, and again, your cleanup workers, first responders, the, the workers on the train, community members uh, at, at distances away, healthcare providers, state agencies, local government, all, all of those need to be involved and need to get accurate and timely information back and forth. And I mean, they need to get that information in a form that is relevant to them. Right. And, uh, and that includes language interpretations, if that's appropriate. And let me ask you, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to go down the list. I'm definitely going to mispronounce some of this. Uh, on that train was butyl acrylate. Um, acrylate. Acrylate. Yeah. Uh, what's it, that in the air? Is that yeah, so problematic? Most of those, um, and I'll have to sort of, you know, I have a list of those, so I'll open up my list. But um, I mean, they're all petrochemicals. They're all derived from, you know, fossil fuel based chemicals, and they're used as feedstock chemicals to make other chemical products. A lot of them, like go, like vinyl chloride, goes into polyvinyl chloride, plastics, things like that. Um, so they're, I mean, they're all chemicals with known hazards, and they're all chemicals that have hazards you know, like I said, throughout their process from extraction through processing, manufacturing and into final products, uh, burning for sure. Um, most of them we don't know a whole lot about as most chemicals we don't know a whole lot about. We, I mean, I mean other, less than uh, not over 90% of chemicals on the market today, we haven't really fully tested for carcinogenicity. Cancer is just a basic thing we should be testing our chemicals for. We don't know very much about them. We do know that most of them are um, respiratory irritants and skin irritants. So that's why people felt a lot of that. Um, one of the things to worry about is long-term or chronic um, continuation of those effects. A lot of times repeat or or continued exposure to to respiratory or skin irritants will actually cause long-term problems, including sensitivity. So people that are exposed now could end up being sensitive to those chemicals in common products 
for months or years to come. Um, one more question about the uh, toxins here. There are obviously, I mean, I don't know how this was allowed, but the rail was put back together and the train is moving again at that location. Is that, how could they have cleaned all this up at the actual blast location? And does that pose more risk that the, with the train now moving again for Norfolk Southern, they're moving mm -hmm. around the uh, chemicals even further? Yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't know the details. I mean, nobody really knows the details of what went into their decisions, but what we're learning from the investigations is that they, the company made the decisions that, that got things moving as quick as possible and saved them money, not the decisions that were the most environmentally and health protective. Um, and I mean, what we're, what we're needing is an independent investigation and an independent investigation into the, the cause needs to be independent of the company. So, uh, and, and the company needs to share information, needs to be a, par a party to the investigation, but not leading the investigation and not holding the results of the investigation. That needs to happen. And I, I think it will. Um, and information needs to be shared in a timely manner accurate information with everybody involved, including uh, unions and, you know, labor, uh, health and safety professionals, um, because the unions have been calling for safety measures that would have made a big difference in this case for a long time. Right. And uh, lastly, you know, in my view, not that this is the exact same thing as Flint, but I mean, it's the same kind of blueprint where, uh, in Flint, residents were told, you know, don't believe your lying eyes or brown water. Your water's fine. They were told that for 18 months. Here, residents are being told the water as of now is fine. The air is fine. They were told to go home. Uh, I fear these things play out a certain way when, when the cameras leave and there's less attention. Uh, numbers maybe get skewed a little bit. They're cherry picked uh, and government along with corporate America, try to kind of sweep things under the rug. Uh, in your view, not to get political, what what needs to happen to make sure that the testing is done correctly? There's credibility. You know, Aaron Brockovich has called for independent testing, yeah. uh, not by the EPA, um, because I, I think you're going to need testing for at least a few years here, uh, as well as some kind of expanded health service for residents in the direct and surrounding yeah. areas. Yeah, I mean, the community should um, be able to sit down with, um, you know, government officials, others, other um, in this in first responders, I always name like other people that are cleanup workers, they should be able to sit down and develop a ongoing uh, long term monitoring strategy for soil, for water sediment. Uh, soil sediment and rivers for environmental impacts like bird kills, fish kills, anything that people notice for for their own health effects, um, for well water, which isn't part of the um, the community water treatment systems. Um, and there needs to, they need to be able to sit down and develop a strategy that people feel comfortable with and that they feel like they're going to get accurate and timely information to them. And they need to have the people they trust as part of developing that. If that's their their physician, or um, you know, they're who, you know who, whoever they feel the 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 um, community feels they're represented by. They need to be there and they need to be represented, and it needs to be ongoing. There's no doubt about that. This was a, right. a huge um, incident. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Glad uh, we could get. Uh, longer information. Uh, I actually saw you at 2 a.m. on CNN uh, while feeding my daughter. Uh, so glad you can come on for a little bit longer with us. Uh, Jennifer Sass, senior scientist uh, with the National Resource Defense Council. Uh, let's stay in touch. Thank you.